All right, everyone, welcome. Thank you for joining us today for the Professional Development Workshop, Intentional and Purposeful Living During the Holidays. The Duluth Chamber is grateful to provide this offering free of charge to our members because of gen the generosity of our sponsor, the College of St. Scholastica Standard School of Leadership, Business and Professional Studies. It's now my honor to introduce you to Rick Ravor, the Dean of Strategic Development of St. Scholastica to say a few words on behalf of their sponsorship. Thanks, Aubrey. Um, I'd like to thank the Chamber team for offering this series and the Stender School is uh, honored to sponsor it. Um, a quick update on the College of St. Scholastica. We're in the process of building a, a new student center that's attached to our Mitchell Auditorium. It's about halfway done and it's gonna open next uh, August. Um, our men's hockey team is having another fantastic year. They're currently ranked number two in the nation. So um, we're also enrolling students for January starts in our master's in applied data analytics, MBA in leadership and change. And we have a new master's in healthcare administration degree. We also have online degrees in business management uh, market and marketing as well. Um, if you have any questions on the programs, please let me know. And finally, thanks to our very own Sarah Wells from uh, St. Scholastica for presenting today. Aubrey? Thank you so much, Rick. I now have the pleasure of introducing our speaker for today, Sarah Wells. Sarah is a licensed clinical social worker who has been a mental health provider for over 20 years. She has experience working with diverse populations across a variety of settings, including healthcare, education, and businesses supporting mental wellness and ensuring that individuals, families, and communities have the skills and resources to manage life stressors is a priority in Sarah's work as a consultant, trainer, and educator. A quick note, this is intended to be a conversational session. Please ask questions either on audio or in the chat. There will also be time for questions at the end. Sarah, thank you so much for joining us today to share more about how intentional and purposeful practices can improve our experiences during the holidays. Take it away. Thank you. Um, so welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Sarah Wells. Um, I'm actually a licensed clinical social worker, um, as Aubrey shared, um, which is social work program is also part of the school of um, the school. Stender School of Business Leadership Technology as well. So um, definitely also a program to check out. Um, but I wanted to share a little bit about what kind of brought us to this topic and how we sort of ended up um, kind of with more of an emphasis on this topic. And part of that was um, at St. Scholastic, as we continue to look at how do we prepare our workforce and how do we prepare um, our young learners um, and, and learners of all ages um, to be prepared for the workforce, to manage the stresses, to manage um, the challenges that they might come into in daily living, um, we started looking um, at the counseling center, what would be some resources and what would be some skills, what would be some tools that we might be able to give students as they enter the workforce. And so that became a very intentional thing for us is to look at what would be some ways we could build resiliency for our students um, as they entered the workforce. And so um, we actually found um, a program through the Mayo Clinic um, called the Resilient Option, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, but that's really the foundation of today's presentation and the foundation of um, our work that we've been doing and some of the work that we're continuing to expand at the College of St. Scholastica. Um, previous to that, I was doing a lot of training around suicide prevention. And one of the things that kept coming up for me was, I love that we're talking about suicide prevention. I love that we're talking about ways to intervene, the ways to support students who might be struggling, the ways to support our community and to support others. Um, but gosh, I wish there was something we would do sooner. I wish we had more preventative strategies. I wish we had more conversations about how to be preventative about managing stress and um, stress and burnout. And so um, again, that's sort of the, the personal backstory of how um, I ended up getting trained in the resilient model um, and how I sort of began sort of jumping into and diving more into um, resiliency work. So I'm going to share with you some of that today, um, and we'll kind of go from there. Um, I will post real quick um, for those of you who can who have access to Google, um, I will go ahead and post in the chat. Um, there's a worksheet that'll go along with that. Um, I won't be able to share today's slides because some of the information is copyrighted, um, but I am happy to share a handout that kind of goes along with that. So um, you have access to that. Um, you can just feel, hit, hit feel free to hit download and you should be able to access that and then make a copy for yourself or be able to access that document um, as well. So if you have any questions as we go, again, feel free to throw those in the chat. All right, I'm going to go ahead and jump in to share my screen. And so as we go today, um, 
I just, again, we're going to kind of look at how do we use intention and purpose during the holidays as we kind of begin the holiday season. Um, we know that during the holidays, we oftentimes have more demands placed upon us. We have more um, requirements, more things that need to be done. We have long to-do lists. Um, we have lots of expectations. Um, and so how do we start to be more purposeful and intentional um, and be able to benefit and, and, and have those mental health benefits of the holidays as opposed to the mental health stresses of the holidays. And so we're going to look at some strategies for that as well. Um, really, we're going to incorporate concepts of curiosity and intentionality um, in our conversation today. Um, and my encouragement to you would be to use those in your daily living routines um, and to think about how I might incorporate these in an everyday um, intentional way. And then we'll also talk about how focus and fatigue can learn to those negative health outcomes and how being more attentive, um, being more focused can also lead to more positive um, redu reduction in stress. So I am actually a certified trainer for the Resilient Option. Um, this was a program that I went through um, and did the certification for. Um, it does come out of the Mayo Clinic if you're happy to look at more information about it. Um, there are different um, opportunities to engage in further work around this um, topic of resilience and resilience building. One of the things I love about this particular program is that it's very adaptable. Um, Dr. Emmett Sood is the founder of the Resilient Option um, and has done a lot of um, research and really understands the neuroscience of how our brain works and does a really nice job, I think, of being able to recognize that even if we're looking at different settings, different age groups, different populations, at the end of the day, there are some basic functions that our brain, how our brain responds and how our brain um, reacts. And so having some the neuroscience around that can be a real big benefit um, as we start to think about stress reduction um, and we start to think about living better. So some of the outcomes of the research, and this is on the website if you're interested in, in it, we see a 25% increase in mindfulness, 25% increase in resilience, and a 14% increase in healthy behaviors. Um, as an employer, those are certainly things that we, we, we want to know about and that we want to be aware of. Um, but for me as a mental health therapist, what I really like is this next section, which talks about 50% decrease in anxiety, 39% decrease in burnout symptoms, and 35% reduction in stress um, from being able to implement some of the strategies that we're going to talk about today. Uh, we won't have time to go through all of the strategies, but I'm going to give you a couple of them and then um, feel free to play around with those and see how they work for you. Um, see if you find those benefits and see if you find um, those helpful for you today. All right. So as we think about it, um, we're really moving in a new place um, in terms of neuroscience and research and sort of really understanding mental health and wellness and I think we're going to continue to see that shift, especially since the pandemic. And I always kind of put up a, a, a question of how many of you wore your seatbelt today? Um, and the majority of the room will typically raise their hand and say, yeah, I, I, I drove in a car, I rode in a car, and I wore my seatbelt. Um, and we do that because we know that seatbelt save lives. Research has shown us that years and years of research um, have demonstrated to us that there's a, there's a benefit to our health and to our safety by wearing a seatbelt. Um, if I ask how many of you brush your teeth today, um, many of you would hopefully say yes. Um, I spent one to two minutes taking care of my teeth today. And again, research tells us there's health benefits um, to doing this simple task that takes one to two minutes. Um, a simple click of a seatbelt takes 30 seconds, maybe at the most, right? Um, brushing our teeth might take a full two minutes um, is what the dentist recommends, but we might do a minute or a full two minutes, um, but it helps improve our health and helps us um, to continue to move towards wellness. We know that eating healthy foods, diet, exercise, sleep are import, important components of staying healthy. Um, I always include bike helmets too um, in this conversation because um, we see despite the research, lots of people still don't utilize helmets, right? Um, but we're still seeing more and more concern and more and more awareness about concussions and the impact of concussions. And this is a growing body of research. Um, I think we're not to the end of it yet, but we continue to research it and to learn about the impact of head injuries. And so. Um, I mentioned these things because I think that we're going to be moving um, the next generation or the next era of mental health is really going to start looking, I think, more at some of our prevention efforts, um, really being able to say, what does build resilience? What keeps our minds healthy? What are the things that we can do every day that take 30 seconds, one minute, two minutes? Um, what are the things that we can be purposeful and intentional about that keep our mind and keep our brain in a good place? Um, and how do we do that, um, again, from a neuroscience perspective? And so um, I think this is really where we're going to see a shift and see a trend. And um, I think this is really the direction we're going to see things move um, in our mental health world.
Um, the pandemic taught us a lot about what what resiliency looked like and, and how people were resilient in ways that we weren't resilient. And so again, I think um, building on that, I think the timing is right and following the pandemic, um, I think we're just gonna continue, continue to see that. Um, really simple science today. We're not gonna get into a bunch of the neuroscience. We don't have time for that today. Um, but basically really simple science is we wanna minimize stress responses. We wanna make sure that we're minimizing our stress responses when we have opportunities and when we have our chances to do so. Um, and those responses might take us one minute, they might take us 30 seconds, they might take us two minutes, right? And so really challenging the way that you might've previously thought about self-care or the way you might've previously engaged in stress management um, would be also one of the challenges for today. So one of the things I think that we've done really well is we've talked a lot about self-care. Uh, and how important self-care is. And I hope that all of you do have some self-care activities. I hope that you all have some self-care routines um, that you engage in or that you practice on a regular basis. However, for me, I'm a busy healthcare professional. Um, at Scholastica, we have um, a, a health sciences center, which includes PT, OT, PA. Um, we also have graduate level social work. And so when I'm working with those healthcare professionals, one of the things that's really important is we want them to be able to be sustainable in our workforce. Um, we also have a huge nursing program at Scholastica as well. Um, we want our healthcare workforce to be sustainable. Um, as well as other professions too. Um, but particularly, there's been a lot of attention on what our healthcare work workforce looks like and the stresses of that. Um, and unfortunately, while self-care is a really great thing, it's sort of an after the fact thing um, it's sort of one of those things where we can do it and it's kind of like the gas in the car. We can do it and we can maintain it and we can put the gas in and we can keep going. But what happens when we get a flat tire or what happens when the stress happens in the middle of the day or what happens when it's a really busy work day and I don't have time to pause to go do a self-care activity? How can I still lower my stress response? And so this is sort of one of the ideas I think as we think about today is to really challenge that to say, what do I do in the moment um, in a busy, fast fast paced environment, maybe that's a business setting or a healthcare environment or whatever that setting might be. Um, what can I do in the moment that's quick and fast that will lower my stress response and keep me calm and help me be able to move forward in a way that's positive um, and not negative on my health? And can I do that throughout the day? And so what I really like about this is being able to do it these types of activities. And again, one minute, two minutes, um, literally um, being able to implement stress response strategies um, quickly and effectively throughout our workday. And so that's a little shift in how we're thinking about self-care, right? Um, because typically self-care is something we think about doing after work, or maybe we do it on our lunch hour, or maybe we do it in the morning. Um, but to fit self-care into our workday for 10 or 20 minutes may not always be an option. So again, kind of why I like this model and why I really like Dr. Sood's work. So um, a lot of the work is grounded in mindfulness, um, self-compassion, and also in positive psychology. And so those are kind of the concepts that we in mental health continue to see running together, right? Um, the research in each of those areas supports the research in the other one, right? Um, and so the more research that we get and the more we're able to support, yeah, these are effective strategies, um, the more I think we're able to hone in on what it is that helps us be able to manage stress and what it is that helps us be able to manage um, stress responses because we're seeing similar patterns and similar things across different modalities and different ideas. And so where do they intersect um, really becomes an important part. So I love this picture. This is just off the internet. I don't have the credit. I don't have the credit for it. Um, I've had it for a long time, um, but I really like this idea. Our brain by default typically runs on, you know, it tends to be busy. Um, it tends to find all of the different things that are buzzing around and going around. It's easily distracted. Um, it wants to take in all the different things, all the shiny objects that are around us and we, all the stresses and demands that are being thrown at us. And so how do we start to sort those out and how do we start to focus really our attention on one or two things at a time. Um, our brain can be really tired and can be really fatigued whenever we're working really hard to sort out all the different things that are coming at us. And so how do we start to be more purposeful and intentional about how we do that? Um, and I like this little picture because if we think about taking a walk on the beach, right? I think it's a great analogy. If we take a walk on the beach um, and we're looking for seashells or we're looking for rocks or in Northern Minnesota, we're looking for agates, right? Um, we have to be really intentional about it. We have to be really paying attention. We have to really be noticing what's around us. And, and so we can walk on the beach and 
you know, take in the sunshine and take in the, the waves and take in, you know, the sights and sounds of Lake Superior. We, or we can be really intentional as we look for agates on the ground or look for special rocks or some things that we're drawn to. Um, and so how do we have to be attention, intentional and purposeful? If we're on the beach, again, the best seashells are the ones that we take a lot of time and that we're intentional around. Um, and so um, really focusing and concentrating on things in short periods of time can be a good thing for our brain and can be something that helps lower our stress response um, from being able to take in everything all at once. Um, and I think we get to pick where we shift our attention. We get to shift where our attention is going to be. Um, do we want to just walk on the beach? Um, do we want to look for shells? Do we want to enjoy the water? Do we want to enjoy the waves? Do we want to take in the sunset? Do we want to take in the sound? Um, we have choices of where, where we draw our attention and where our attention is drawn. Um, and so as we think about that, the more we can have control over where we put our attention, um, the better we're going to do in terms of stress response. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about this as we go. Um, but overall, I mean, if we think about um, just even the difference between positive emotion and negative emotion, um, if I if my attention shifts towards negative emotion, which is the natural tendency, um, and I can't shift away from that, then my stress response is going to go up. But if I can shift my response and I can have control over where my attention and focus is, can I shift my attention and focus to something more positive? Can I shift my attention and focus to something different um, during times of stress? Can I change perspectives? Can I change um, the way I see something? Can I change something about the environment um, to be able to minimize that stress response? So that's kind of what we're looking at as we go. Um, all right, so as we go along, we're going to talk a little bit about curious moments. And one of the things I like about practicing curious moments, and this is sort of your first challenge for the week, is to really take time to practice curious moments. Find things to be curious about. Take one to two minutes and really investigate things. Pay attention to things. Let your brain have the opportunity to really focus on something um, and give it that undivided attention. Um, and and again, the calmness that can come from that at times. And so we're going to do a couple of quick activities. Um, Welcome to join in, participate as you're able, um, but we'll kind of go through these quickly. Um, this is, I want you to just take a look at this picture and just write down maybe one sentence that you might say about this picture. We're going to have to take about five seconds to do that. Okay, and kind of hold that, that idea of what that, that picture might be. All right, and then I'm going to jump us to a different picture. Okay, a little some holiday poinsettias here. Um, but I want you to take a about 15 seconds and look at the poinsettias um, and really give it your full undivided attention. Now, intrusive thoughts are going to come in. It's what our brain does. Our brain is designed to pay attention to things. Our, des our brain is designed to keep the motor running, right? But as those intrusive thoughts come in, just push them away um, and spend about 10 seconds and tell me what you notice or tell me what you might see. I'll ask you afterwards um, in this picture. So we'll go start now. Okay, and anybody want to just throw in the chat what you noticed? Anything that you drew your attention to or anything that you noticed about this picture? My chat working, there we go, okay. Um, the gold center, okay, what else do we notice about the, the flower or flowers? So maybe you noticed the ridges on the line. Maybe you noticed um, the different layers of the flowers, the different layers of the leaves, the symmetry, how it was balanced, the green leaves, okay? The little shading, even the coloring of how the green leaves might look, um, how bold the red is against the color. Good, thank you. Um, so yeah, if we take the time to really focus on that flower, we tend to notice things that we might not otherwise notice. Um, and again, it calms our brain. Our brain has to pause. Our brain has to be focused. Our brain has to pay attention. Um, and it actually helps to decrease maybe all of the other input that's coming in at, into our brains and all of the other distractions and things going on by really being attentive and purposeful um, about focusing on this flower. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and move us on to the next one. 
um, which similarly, I want you to do the same thing. I'm going to give you about 15 seconds um, to check out this picture, and then I'll have you do the same thing and respond to chat with what you notice. Okay, and let's go ahead and throw in the chat. What did you notice? The mostly smiling faces, okay. The rainbow color in the background, so the pink and the, and the yellow and the green, um, sort of the different nationalities, okay. Different ethnicity and skin tones, perhaps, of the dancers. The spotlight feeling of the middle color, okay, um, innocence, okay, so that bring up the image or the idea of innocence or the feeling of innocence. Also, the dancer's hands will be kind of different. Um, they each have kind of a unique pose. Their feet are a little bit different. So different things that you've noticed within this picture um, by just noticing it again, sort of taking a pause. Um, and the other thing I want you to think about, too, as you did that exercise, did you feel a sense of calm? Were you able to just focus on this one thing? Were you able to just give it your undivided attention um, and be truly intentional um, with the exercise sort of as we did it? Okay. And then the last one I'm going to show you um, is going to be familiar, but I'd like to just for you to just look at, take a moment to look at it. Um, and, and again, thinking about what you notice right away um, and how it is that you notice the picture um, when I share it. And then we'll kind of throw that up in the chat a little bit as well. All right. So the next one. Okay. And so one of the things is this is a picture you're familiar with. This is a picture that I showed you earlier. Um, and what I'm curious about is, did you view it differently this time than what you did in the first time that I asked you to notice the picture? Um, and so I, that's my question from the chat is, first time, did you notice it more from a broad perspective? Were you able, did you notice it differently? Did you see it differently? Did you perceive it differently um, in the chat? Um, more peaceful, the no noticed in the texture in the background the second time. Yep, I noticed the colors were different, okay? And so more focused on the details, exactly. Um, I love this one as a recently trained, oops, ART, ART, I couldn't read it, moved up. ART therapist, it makes me think about the foundation and what we can fill up with what we are and what we can fill up with for what we need. Very peaceful photo. More details, the colors are more vibrant, okay? Um, and again, this is sort of why I have us do this exercise because I think that we tend to go through the world, we're not mindful. We sort of take things in really rapidly, we view them really quickly. Um, and so being in the habit of pausing in the world, being in the habit of taking time to be mindful, being purposeful, being intentional, it doesn't have to be a whole practice of meditation, right? Um, sometimes I work with clients and they'll say, well, I've already, I've done meditation and it wasn't effective for me. And I'll say, well, that's like me asking you to cook a gourmet meal. Can you, can you make mac and cheese? Right. Um, can we start with the basics? And so sometimes the basics of mindfulness are really just being grounded in the moment. And it could be a moment, right? It could be a minute. Um, this whole series of exercises took us probably less than two minutes to do. Um, and already you saw the shift in how much more mindful you were from the first picture to the last picture, how differently you perceived the picture, how much more calming it might have felt for you um, just by experiencing it in a different way. And so I really love this example because this is really something that really plays itself out in terms of how can we be mindful in a moment? How can we pause um, and take in the, the world around us or the people around us and be aware of those um, as I drive to Scholastica each morning, I come through by the Copper Top Church. And as you come over around that corner, um, I can always look over the lake, right? Almost every day. Um, and so I pause for a moment, whether it's 10 seconds, 30 seconds, as I come around that corner, it's not very long because I'm usually driving. Um, 
but being able to notice, to be mindful, to be intentional and notice the sunset or to note or the sunrise, I'm sorry, but to notice the sunrise in the morning um, and to pause with it for a moment. And instead of just being like, oh yeah, there's the lake, but to come around the corner and wonder, what am I going to see today? I wonder what the sun is going to look like. I wonder if the, it's going to be a gorgeous sunrise or if it's going to be a cloudy day. Um, and so those little ways that we start to incorporate mindfulness um, and the calm that that can bring us or the joy that that can bring us um, when we see the world with curiosity. Um, as we think about the holidays, um, we, we have all kinds of novel things that we're drawn to, Christmas lights, holiday lights, um, different foods, different festivities, um, different traditions. Um, being curious, being intentional about those things be, can be a really part of the holiday that we can sometimes just rush through. Um, this weekend, we'll go get a Christmas tree. Um, we always wait for my son. His birthday is in November or in December. And so we always wait till after his birthday to go um, get our Christmas tree. That's kind of been our tradition, um, purposefully and intentionally. Um, and he's actually at college now. So we go pick him up and he comes home this weekend. Um, one of the things we'll do is go get our tree. Um, and as we go get our tree, that's an opportunity for us um, to look at how will be how will I be intentional and purposeful? Um, will we take the time to walk through the fields and to to smell the scents and to take in the air? Um, what will that look like for us, right? Um, as we practice our family tradition and that's our family holiday. Um, but I want you to think about what will you do that will be purposeful and intentional around your um, holiday season or um, whatever that holiday might be or whatever that um, festivities or traditions might look like. And so again, really simple ways that we can just pause and be mindful um, in a moment or be curious. And so can we can we view the world with more curiosity um, to keep our brain in a little bit lower stress response? Um, I show this video real quick. Um, if it's a if it doesn't work, somebody please chat with me. I think it should be okay based on the testing that we did. Um, but I love this idea um, of really simple mindfulness. It really kind of breaks it down. Um, Again, with mindfulness, we have the opportunity to focus on what we choose to focus. Um, I also have students they will say, well, I've tried breathing and I can't really focus on breathing. And I'm like, that's okay. Then let's focus on something else. Um, for some people that might be focusing on my body and my body sensations. For some people that might be focusing on the external world, focusing on things and objects and, and things around me. For some people that might be doing, focusing on loving kindness or um, loving kindness meditation or focusing on the way that I feel or different, different parts of that. And so as we think about different meditations, even, um, I also encourage people to think about what works for you, because I think sometimes we are taught that this is what sh we should be doing, or this is what we ought to be doing, um, or this works for someone else. But if it doesn't work for us, it doesn't work for us. Um, and so I really like this description of the monkey mind. Um, and I really like the way that they talk about, you know, really that individual ability to choose what it is that we focus on and we get to pick where we focus and where, where we want to be curious and what we want to be curious about and whether that's your breath your body the people around you the world around you um doesn't make a lot of difference as long as we're getting that ability to focus our brain to calm our brain and that opportunity to be fully engaged so i'm gonna play this real quick it takes about three minutes i think we can meditate everywhere anytime even three seconds, two seconds, while you're walking, while you're having coffee and tea, while you're having a meeting, so you can meditate. Many people have a little bit of misunderstanding about meditation. They think meditation meaning think of nothing, concentrate, <laughs> so push too much. So we cannot block thought and emotion. In fact, we need thought and emotion. So whether you listen to your monkey mind or not, that's an issue. What I call monkey mind, Mine is chatting, you know, pala 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 yada yada. So monkey mind is giving you opinion. So whether you listen to opinion or not, it's up to you, right? So through meditation, what we do is we have to make friends with the monkey mind. But how to make friends? Just giving banana doesn't work, you know. <laughs> so right method is you need to give job to monkey mind. How to give job monkey mind? So the simple meditation technique is be aware of the breath. So you ask monkey mind, hello, watch breath. So monkey mind says, ah, yeah, good idea. And be aware of breath. Breathing in, breathing out, breathing in. There's a lot of thought comes at the background. Don't care, no problem. So as long as if you're not forget your breath, 
Anything is okay. No need too much concentration. Just simply be aware of your breath. Breathe in, out, in. Even two breath, one breath. So therefore, we can meditate everywhere, anytime. I really like just the idea that, um, again, we kind of move a little bit to the idea that like our brain, whoops, sorry, to move that forward. Sorry. <laughs> have to move that slide. Um, so being able, I really like that video, being able to, again, focus on the breath. We know that that can have calming sensations for our body. We know that that can be a calming sensation for us. Um, but then also being able to also focus our brain, focus our focus where our attention is going and and how we bring that focus and attention um, into the world with us can be a really helpful thing um, and really positive in managing our stress and our stress responses. Um, and one of the things I love about Dr. Sood's work is that he literally, you know, watches the neuroimaging and watches brain activity as people can focus on something or bring their attention to something um, and noticing how the brain responds to that. And so, um, again, these are the things that can we incorporate this in? And my challenge to you would be, can you incorporate curious moments? Can you incorporate moments of curiosity um, into your day two or three times, even if it's only for 30 seconds, right? Or even if it's only for 20, you know, for two minutes really quickly, um, what does that look like? Um, and can you feel those benefits? And can you feel that sense of calm as well? All right, I'm going to jump back in here and see if I can move my slideshow ahead. Give me just a minute. Um, there we go. All right, so as we think, am I sharing okay? Nope, it didn't share. Hold on. My apologies. So as we think about being curious, um, I think we can definitely have those curiosity moments um, and thinking about how do we go through the world? How do we incorporate those curiosity moments, um, again, in very little short chunks of time um, to help keep us calm, to help keep our nervous system regulated um, can be a really important thing. I tend to lean towards nature. I tend to lean towards my external environment because that works for me. Um, that doesn't mean it's how you have to do it. You might choose to focus more on your breath. You might choose to focus again on some uh, focus again on more of some of those other things that we talked about. All right. And as we look then, um, the other thing we can do is we can pay attention to people around us and we can be intentional and engaged in the people around us. And so um, one of the other um, strategies that Dr. Sood has in his materials is talking about the two minute rule. Um, and the two minute rule is really giving that curiosity to other people, um, being curious about people in the moment, being connected to them. Um, we also know that we are social creatures. Um, the human baby is the most helpless creature born on the earth. Um, human babies will literally die without connection. They can't walk, they can't talk, they can't search for food, they can't protect themselves. Um, they're very, very vulnerable. And so we are wired for that connection and we're wired for that engagement um, with other people. And so um, we also know that when we're around other people, um, that we naturally get some of those brain chemicals, oxytocin, serotonin, um, those are sort of the, the feel good chemicals um, that we can typically get when we're around positive people and people in our lives um, that we can have positive relationships with. Um, we also know that when people are feeling stressed or anxiety, anxious or depressed, um, the isolation and loneliness um, tend to make those symptoms worse, right? They tend to make those and exaggerate those symptoms because we know that connection can lower our anxiety, can lower that response. Um, and so being connected to people. Um, and so one of the other things is how do we spend two minutes? really truly engaging with someone else. Because many times we go through our day, we go through the motions, um, but we don't necessarily sit down and truly engage. Um, I think about when my kids were little and um, there was a point in time where we had moved and I was um, home with my with my toddler at the time and we would go through the day and he would do stuff and I would do stuff, but there was rarely time where I would actually sit down and maybe really truly engage for five or 10 minutes. Um, and I realized that, oh wait, I really need to sit down and actually engage and play with the trucks or play with the block or play with whatever it was. Um, I think I was better at that maybe even when they were little, as they get older and become more teenagers, they're in and out of my house, right? They're gone and 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 to sit down and have a conversation. Um, I think it's also one of the reasons we see some things like um, family dinners being an effective resiliency building skill, right? Because there's an intentionalness about it. There's a purposefulness about it. Um, during the pandemic, um, I sort of read this. It was kind of a random read. I can't remember even where I read it. Um, but one of the suggestions 
questions that they had um, for building connection and just sort of grounding and recentering was that you lit a that you lit a candle during your dinner time. Um, and that that was like an intentional and purposeful behavior was to light that candle at during a dinner time. I was really interesting because I was like, well, we can do that. I have candles at my house. Let's see how this goes. And so um, I go off in my own little experiment and um, throw my candle on the table. And as we get dinner ready, I light the candle and everyone sits down and we eat and we talk and we do what we're going to do. And then when dinner's over, I blow out the candle. Right. Um, and what I didn't realize until later was that my kids actually really loved that exercise because it started the lighting of the candle sort of started that this is our time together. This is our dinner. There's no phones at the table. We're just going to enjoy each other. And then that time was limited. And then we blew the candle out and it was back to the busy world. Right. Um, but I didn't realize how much just that little habit or that little intentionalness sort of set the tone for starting to say, hey, we're going to really engage together. We're going to really be present and have, you know, have this meal together excuse me, have this meal together. Um, and it also kind of broke up our day because during the pandemic, during lockdown, all the days were running together, right? Um, people were doing, we were in and out and I mean, we were all at home, but there was no routine. There was no rituals. There was no daily habits, right? And so that ability to just sort of say, okay, we're going to have a daily habit now, light the candle and eat dinner and visit with each other and then blow the candle out and go back to doing our thing um, really made a big difference and really made a big impact. And so thinking about what are the ways that we can bring that intentionalness to relationships and what does that look like and how can we do that um, as we go through, um, through the, during family times where we might be gathering um, with traditions and holidays. Um, and so we want to kind of keep that in mind. Um, also keeping in mind, I'm talking about mostly healthy relationships, right? Um, this isn't necessarily a workshop on um, resolving trauma or resolving negative relationships or working through family issues. Um, we're talking today about how to build resiliency. Um, we're assuming some level, general level of health and well-being um, that might already be present. And so keeping that in mind too, um, we, we want to kind of be aware of that. But are there ways that I could, are there ways that I could engage that would better support uh, my own mental health by being focused and attentive to those around me, um, knowing that that's a positive um, neural pathways and creates positive emotion, creates positive, positive chemical reactions for those people involved. So um, something to just kind of be aware of. And as we do think about um, positive relationships. I also think we we also want to talk a little bit about adapting mindset. Um, and so as we do think about families, and as I was putting this together, and I was thinking about which are the ones I want to talk about. Um, as we think about families, we think about engaging with other people, which is often pretty common in the holidays. Um, we also want to sometimes think about perspective taking and how compassion can help us. Um, sometimes we're coming at things from different perspectives, right? Um, we might have people in our lives that we love and care about who have different perspectives from ours. Um, and how do we recognize that? And how can we hold that um, as being different? And so I like this little cartoon of one person saying, oh, there's a boat. And the boat's saying, oh, there's land, right? Um, different perspectives. It doesn't mean that one is right or wrong. Um, but I think sometimes we can get caught in thinking that our perspective is the right perspective. Um, and so can we practice perspective taking? Um, can we practice taking a step back? And one of the tools I really like to do that is by um, assuming positive intent. Um, and this is really the skill for compassion with others. Can we assume positive intent? Um, and again, we're may not, we may, may not be talking about people that um, that you've maybe had a history with or maybe where there's a, a history of hurt and trauma. But for the most part, when we have some disagreements or some minor ruffles or some minor butting of heads, um, can we take a step back and assume positive intent, right? Um, I think about, you know, a glass of water and how many times do people intentionally plan to spill their water? Um, usually they don't, right? Most people don't choose to say, oh, I think I'm going to spill my water. Um, most of the time it's on accident. Most of the time it's unintentional. Um, it may not mean it's not hurtful. It may not mean that it's not, um, not a challenge, but if we can assume positive intent, we can have a little bit more compassion. Um, and we're able to see people through a different lens. And again, that's good for our mental health because we feel a sense of calm. So even as I'm talking, if you think about someone intentionally spilling water, you probably feel a little bit more anxious or a little bit more, you know, frustration than if I think about, yeah, no one spills water on purpose. Most of the time people don't choose to spill their water. Um, and so we feel just a little bit more compassion, a little bit more sense of calm. 
Um, and so my challenge to you through through the holiday would be if you do have challenging people in your life or people that you might have had conflict with or, or challenges with, is, is there a way to assume positive intent for the gathering? Is there a way to assume um, the best intention? Um, assume that we have we have a wishes we have wishes for wellness for each other, wishes for well being for each other. Um, can we assume that um, and maybe approach that with a calmer sense for again for our own self because it lowers our stress response, right? We feel better when we're less stressed, so our lower stress response is also going to be a positive impact for our mental health. Um, and then also with that, as we think about self. Um, Really simple. I just like the word and, right? Um, as we think about compassion for self, um, can we look at things with an and lens? And is there more to it, right? So that person who might be frustrating to me um, might also have a strength or might also have something that um, I really like about them or something that's really important to me. Um, I might really be annoyed by how this happens, but I might also really appreciate this. Uh, many times I think for in our lives, we tend to want to be polarized. Um, and when our stress and anxiety goes up, and if you think about this during COVID, um, when stress and anxiety go up, we tend to get rigid in thinking um, or we have chaos. So we either have chaos or rigidity. Um, we usually find a lot of people move towards rigidity whenever there's times of stress. And if you think about some of the tensions and some of the, the way the world was politically um, in terms of some of the COVID stuff, um, people were very polarized in opinions and very polarized in their perspectives. And I think we have to keep that in mind as we go into you know, being with people that we want to have relationship or with, or we might have an interest in having a relationship with is that when we're stressed, we tend to be more polarized. We tend to, we tend to sort of say, no, this is the way I see it. We tend to be more rigid. Um, we tend to th see things with an either or lens, right? So the more stressed I am, the more likely I am to see things with either or. And the more I see things with either or, the more my stress level is going to go up. So an and perspective is a great perspective. Um, an and perspective says both are true. Both this is hard and there's something I there's something here for me. There's something that's important to me here. Um, and so we think about even if that what that might look like or what that might be. Um, I always like to mention too toxic positivity whenever I have this part of the conversation. Um, one of the things I think is really important is the skills we're talking about today are skills for you. They're not skills to put on other people, right? Um, so my goal for you is to learn some strategies that you can use to keep yourself calm um, and to be able to, again, sort of um, override those negative stress responses. Um, by nature, our brain is designed to follow the negative right? We're designed to pay attention to the negative things in the world. We're designed by default um, to protect ourselves. And usually those are the negative things. Um, and so we tend to go to the negative. And so if we can, you know, challenge ourselves and say, okay, what's the other part? What's the and? Um, then we can sometimes be able to shift that. And so um, when we think about toxic positivity, I think one of the problems with toxic toxic positivity is sort of this like, oh, we could just be happy. We should just look at the other side of a coin. And I want to be really clear, that's not what I'm saying, right? Um, part of Part of being able to see an and is also acknowledging how hard something is. So this is really hard. And there's more to the story or and there's something here that's important. And so I think two parts of this is one is that it's for you, not for other people. So we don't get to tell other people um, to see the world differently. We don't get to tell them happiness is a choice. We don't get to tell them, you know, hey, look on the bright side of things. Um, what we might say to them is this is really hard for them. Um, this is really hard for me. Um, and I'm going to choose to see it differently. I'm going to choose to shift my mindset. I'm going to choose to look at my choose to look at the situation through a different lens. Um, and so I think that's also another part. Um, and for self, I think it's also important to really acknowledge that the Kristen Knapp's a great author that talks a lot about self-compassion, but acknowledging the suffering, acknowledging the hardness of the situation. Um, we as human beings are always going to experience negative emotion. Um, and so when we encounter that negative emotion, what do we do with it? Um, and it can't, we don't necessarily want to dismiss it, um, but can we acknowledge it as hard? And then can we have a different perspective? And I think that's what really helps us to be able sometimes to tolerate difficult situations and get us out of that polarized thinking where it's either or, 
right? Um, is that perspective of and. So um, this would be another challenge for you through the holidays would also be to be able to have compassion for others and then to give compassion to yourself, right? What is the and? What is the and part that becomes really important? Is there is there some perspective taking that I could put in place um, that would help me see things from a less rigid perspective that would help me move things more to a to a to an either or right, away from either or into an and, which would be good. All right. And as I kind of want to watch our time a little bit. Um, and then the next one, we talk about connection to meaning. Um, one of the things I think is really important is we need to know as we go through life, we sort of need those guiding principles, right? We're guided by our values. And when our values and our behaviors line up, we do better. Um, then when we're asked to do something that doesn't align with our values, when we're asked to do something that doesn't line up with our beliefs. Um, and so I think it's really important as we go through some of these holiday times or as we go through whatever the traditions and festivities you will be doing um, to think about what is the meaning and what is the part that connects me? What's the part that's important to me? Um, and I would even challenge you to even maybe pause for a minute. Um, even as we're doing this workshop today, pausing for a second and thinking about what is it? What does it mean to me? What do these times mean? What does the, what do I want to do? What is my goal? Because sometimes when we know what that goal is and we can more clearly articulate it, then sometimes we can let go of some of the things that don't align with our goal. We get long list of shoulds and ought tos and social media will tell us all over the, all the things that we should be doing. Right. Um, you know, we need to move our elf 15 times and we need to bake 500 do dozens of cookies and we need to make sure decorate five trees and, you know, have the family over and whatever else. And, you know, make sure that we make the breads and the whatever it looks like. And so I think we have to be really careful about um, getting caught up in some of the shoulds. And really taking a step back and thinking about what is the, what is the part that I that grounds me? What is the goal? What is it that I'm intending? What is it the part that I'm aligned with? What are the beliefs and values that that are the central part of the activities that we're going to do? Um, and so maybe just take a quick minute. I do like I said. I do want to kind of watch our time a little bit, but. If nothing else, maybe make a note to do this later, uh, maybe as we finish today, but to take some time and say, what is it that I want to accomplish? What is it? What's the perspective taking that I want to have? What is the goal that's going to drive me um, for this? And this also works with businesses. If you think about a business, what is my goal for business? What is the what's the foundation? Many businesses have mission statements. They have value statements. Right. Um, and the goal of that is to make sure that their work continues to align with the reason, the mission and the goals that they originally envisioned and that they originally saw. We can do the same thing within our families and within our um, plans for activities, right? We can also say, okay, what is the goal? What is the plan? What is it that we want to achieve? Um, and then keeping that central and focused can also be um, really refreshing for us during the holidays. So I would encourage you to do that at the end of today as you get a chance. Um, and then we also know that our that we know that celebration and joy are good for us, right? We need to celebrate our competencies. We need to celebrate the things that we're good at. Um, during the pandemic, Bessel van der Kolk um, said we need to, he had a whole list of things that he said are good. These things are going to be problematic in the pandemic. This was early on. Um, a mental health therapist, I was like, okay, okay. And then as the pandemic unfolded, I was like, oh, wow, he was spot on, right? Um, but celebrating our competencies are one of the things that we talk a lot about. Um, it's really easy to get caught up in comparison. Um, it's really easy, especially with social media, um, to get up and get caught up into comparing apples and oranges, right? As the saying goes, um, I think it's really easy. We need to think about what we do well. And then how does what we do well align with those beliefs and values? Um, how do those things all come together? Um, I always joke and say, if I always want to feel terrible about my house, watch a little HGTV and I'll feel like my house is a disaster, right? Um, if I want to, you know, not feel good about the, you know, taco tacos that I just served for dinner, go watch a gourmet cooking show, right? Um, so I think we can really get caught up in the world of comparison um, and comparison is just sucks the joy right on out of everything. So um, I think we have to be careful. Um, there's a saying that says we often also compare our weaknesses to other people's strengths. Um, and I'll say that again, because I think it's so important. When we get into comparison, we oftentimes compare our weaknesses to other people's strengths. And then we overlook our own strengths. So as we go through, you know, through things, what are our competencies? What are the things that we're good at? What are the things that we do well? And being able to celebrate those um, and to bring those um, and to stay in those things that we do well is really important as well.
So as I kind of do that, I want to make sure we kind of have enough time to kind of answer any questions. Um, but just sort of some ideas, you kind of have the, the worksheet there that kind of says, hey, well, how will I implement this? Some strategies that you can look at. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to un unmute yourself, throw those out, um, throw those in the chat. I'm happy to, to answer any questions that you have as well. Um, Again, these are some of the things that we're trying to work at St. Scholastica to teach our students as we kind of move into um, how do we live well. Um, certainly not a replacement for counseling, not a replacement for mental health therapy or services, um, but sort of a place of coming from a place of wellness, um, coming from a place of how do we do prevention around mental wellness and how do we ensure um, that we are able to manage the stresses that come our way, um, particularly as technology just continues to throw them out the, at us and other work and life demands kind of come our way. So um, that's kind of what I have for today. Anything, any other questions, feel free to throw them out, throw them in the chat. Hey, Sarah, where was the worksheet again? Where was the Oh, worksheet? it should have been in the chat. Let me see if I'll okay. repost it. Um, there we go. I'll read through it in the chat. It's a Google Doc. So if you have trouble getting it, you can also just shoot me an email. Um, my, whoops, I added an extra letter to that email. Don't look at that. <laughs> my email is sweld1 at css.edu. Um, if you have questions, um, want more information, um, feel free to reach out um, and we'll get that to you. Okay. There's also some resources on the bottom of the um document too that give you sort of the citations and some of those things. And you just have to be sure to send it to everyone. So, and not the Duluth chamber. Only. Oh, there we is go. that what I did? Yep. Oh, okay. There we I'm go. so sorry. Okay, great. Oh, there it is. Thank you. Did it go? Yep. Okay. Let me, that's what I did wrong. All right. Well, thanks to the chamber for having me today and kind of go from there. Thank you so much, Sarah. Are there any final questions anyone wants to ask or put in the chat before we wrap up today? Very Sarah, good reminders. Are there any apps that you recommend or? Um, so there is, Dr. Sue does have one. Um, it's called Mood Candy. You have to kind of be a little careful though, because there's another one called Mood Candy that's very different. Mm -hmm. um, so looking for that resilient option, um, going to the resilient option website is probably the easiest way to kind of go in there. Dr. Sue does have some videos and some other things um, on there, um, but I do like his app. It's called, again, it's called Mood Candy um, and it's a white app with like a little, it almost looks like jelly beans is what I think. It's like a little white app with like jelly beans around it. So um, there, that is an app that's available. Um, I think it's for free um, through that Dr. Suit has developed. So, but super pleased with his work and I'm happy to bring this information today. Wonderful. Well, if anyone thinks of any questions after we log off, um, Sarah's emails in the chat, um, I'll email out the Google Doc link as well. Um, and Sarah, Casey said, I just want to say thank you. This was very helpful. Um, and that's concludes our session for the day. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Rick. On behalf of the entire Duluth Chamber team, we wish um, everyone here today happy holidays. Have a great day. Thanks.